Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game that's powered by the inventiveness and innovations of its player base, because every deck, good or bad, has someone behind it trying to figure out just how to break it. But the opposite is also true, because no matter how invincible a deck might appear in the metagame, every deck has a weakness, it's just a matter of finding it. In both cases, deck builders are often led to the game's underbelly, scouring its debt's card pool, and strange new releases in the hopes of finding something forgotten or ignored that they can crack wide open. Often, people come back from this search empty-handed. But sometimes, and only sometimes, duelists will find cards that can revolutionize the way a deck, or even the game itself, is played. So today, we're going to look at the strangest and weirdest cards of 2023, why they're so peculiar, and how they manage to sneak into the game's meta. And at number 10, we have the original Gate Guardian, one of the worst boss monsters in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh that's actually managed to steal quite a few top spots this year. But when you actually look at Gate Guardian, the only question that comes to mind is how? Because all Gate Guardian is, is a level 11 beat stick, and while it does have an impressive 3750 attack, needing to tribute each of its three components while you have it in hand has always made it clunky and really gimmicky as a boss monster that's nearly impossible to summon. Or at least it used to be because 2023 was actually a great year for Gate Guardian. As with the release of Maze of Memories back in March, the archetype was somehow salvaged from a completely unplayable state to actually being a pretty respectable rogue strategy capable of taking on meta decks and sometimes even winning. The best part is that each of the three original component parts of the Gate Guardian, Sangha, Suijin, and Kanzajin, despite their mediocre and outdated effects, all play an integral role in the strategy and play well with the deck's new support, which allows you to easily bring these monsters to the field as continuous spells, so they can be used for the contact fusion of the deck's latest boss monster, including the latest retrain of Gate Guardian itself, Gate Guardians Combined. So, you might be forgiven for thinking that the original Gate Guardian was used as a tech choice in a competitive Gate Guardian decks, especially because Combined can actually float into the original Gate Guardian if your opponent manages to deal with it and leave you an impressive beat stick. But the truth is, even Gate Guardian decks don't play the original Gate Guardian. You see, the new support does a great job of facilitating their latest fusion boss monsters, and makes the components of the first Gate Guardian very playable. But it actually doesn't make summoning the original Gate Guardian any easier, because the new cards place these components as continuous spells, and you can't actually tribute a spell for Gate Guardian Summon. And even if you had the opportunity to summon Gate Guardian with the effect of Combine, you would never want to, because you actually have the choice of summoning any level 11 or lower Gate Guardian monster from your deck or extra deck, which happens to include the new Gate Guardian fusion monsters. So there's no reason to play the OG Gate Guardian when you can summon a Searcher, a Battle Trick, or even a Spell and Trap Negate, all of which also float into their other components. But then that begs the question, if Gate Guardian decks weren't playing Gate Guardian, then where did it see play? And the answer is surprising, because Gate Guardian randomly shows up in some meta-relevant strategies across last year's regional list from the likes of Manadium and even Rescue Ace. Now, usually, if there's a one-of in a list that sticks out like a sore thumb, there's some trick or gimmick to it. It could be a bridge for a small world to allow you to consistently gain access to a specific starter, it could be material necessary for a fusion or a ritual monster, or maybe it's simply searchable off of some effect for free advantage. But in Gate Guardian's case, the answer is a lot simpler than you'd think. The reason why the card seemingly props up in random deck lists across the year is actually because it's a joke. You see, in Yu-Gi-Oh, if you manage to do well at a regional or an OTS championship, you automatically get an invite for your Continental World Championship qualifier. But you only ever need to do well at a single event to get the invitation, allowing you to take it easy when playing at other events. So people use this as an opportunity to top with their favorite rogue decks, but in the Melbourne Yu-Gi-Oh community, some players will instead choose to enter with a copy of Gate Guardian in their deck that does almost nothing, which is honestly a pretty big flex if you're able to top an event while playing an almost useless brick. So, while these strategies don't really get an opportunity to go Gate Guardian mode on your opponent, it's definitely funny to see that Gate Guardian did manage to have a place in the meta this year, even if it wasn't in the way you'd expect. And it's almost encouraging to know that even in the modern day, you can still play decks with some breaky cards that you're just playing for fun, and still manage to do pretty well. And at number 9 on this list, we have Mushroom Man number 2 a card whose effect seemingly only serves to give your opponent an advantage. Because all it does is allow you to give control of Mushroom Man to your opponent by paying 500 life points. And then, during each of their standby phases, the controller of Mushroom Man number 2 takes 300 damage. Now, usually it's a bad idea to give your opponent a free monster, especially in the modern era where extra decks are more than likely to have some kind of generic link payoff waiting in the wings. 
And mushroom number two doesn't do anything to stop that, as the only real detriment to your opponent is that they'll take 300 points of burn damage on the turn, which is less than the 500 you paid to give control of it to your opponent. However, despite how difficult it might be to seem, Mushroom number 2 actually had its place as a powerful tool in the Kashtira arsenal. The idea behind it is simple, but genius. At full power, Kashtira was more than capable of comboing off and reaching his oppressive boss monster without normal summoning a single time. And when multiple Shangra Ira were paired with Diabolus the Mind Hacker, you could lock your opponent out of 5 of their monster or spell and trap card zones turn 1, and lock even more zones during their turn potentially flood getting your opponent out of playing the game entirely. However, you didn't always have access to the lock 5 combo, and even if you did, you had to wait until your opponent activated a monster effect so you could banish more cards face down to lock 10. But that's exactly why Mushroom Man's inclusion was so smart, because if you normal summoned Mushroom Man and gave it to your opponent, they'd be forced to activate a monster effect in their standby phase, whether they liked it or not. And this gave you the opportunity to trigger your cash tier monsters, Banish cards face down with Fenrir, Unicorn, and Minehacker, and lock the rest of your opponent's zones with Shangri -E Ra. And that's not even where Mushroom Number 2's utility ends, because it was even a silver bolt in the Cash Tira Mirror Match, because it did something very annoying for an opponent playing the same deck, it gave them a monster. This was a huge detriment for a deck whose best starters relied on not controlling any monsters, which made it a very funny counter to one of the strongest decks of the year, especially when you could thrust for reinforcements of the army to search Mushroom Man, who for some reason happens to be a warrior monster. Now, technically speaking, this tech was discovered in 2022 in the OCG, but it only had a chance to shine in the TCG in 2023 after Cash Tira finally managed to reach full power. And while it was a card that saw some solid experimentation, it wasn't really too successful purely because it wasn't really necessary. Zone locking wasn't the only way for Kashira to win the duel, and even if they were going for that, your opponent had to activate a monster effect at some point, which you could just use as an opportunity to clear up the rest of their zones. But it did lay the foundation in the idea that Kashira could spend their normal summon on just about anything, including Ebly, which, like Mushroom Man, would give your opponent a free monster, but was much stronger since it could lock your opponent out of special summoning anything but links while you controlled it, which often led to decks being floodgated from playing anyways, zone lock or not. So while Mushroom Man was barely around in the TCG cast tier lists, its strange utility and ability to shut down opposing cast tier strategies made it a somewhat viable option. And its use opened the floodgates for experimenting in a deck that realized that they could spend their normal summon on pretty much anything else. And infesting the number 8 spot is Naturia Stinkbug, who proved itself more than capable of protecting your Naturia monsters. But not from card effects, from battle, because Naturia Stinkbug is an archetypal negate attack that's managed to see play in the modern metagame. Because while you control Stinkbug, if an attack is declared on a Naturia monster you control, you can send it from your field to the graveyard to negate the attack and then end the battle phase. And the reason why this card is so weird is because in the modern era, you rarely see battle tricks like it ever see any kind of success. Back in the days of classic Yu-Gi-Oh, cards that could fade a battle phase or prevent your monsters from being destroyed by battle were actually quite valuable, as they would guarantee that you'd survive to the next turn, and then you had follow up in whatever monsters you had on field, which could often be the difference between being in a controlling position or a losing one. Meanwhile, in the modern day, while the battle phase is still a solid option to remove your opponent's monsters in the field, no one really plays battle tricks anymore, since it's pretty easy to set up a negate prior to the battle phase, or access a piece of removal to get rid of it from the field before it can be activated. But while this is conventional wisdom, it's by no means a hard rule, and certain strategies actually get a lot from denying their opponent a battle phase, including Naturia Runic. Runic decks in general benefit a lot from stopping your opponent's battle phase, as it means they can keep acquiring advantage every single turn with fountain draws without the risk of being OTK allowing you to gradually wood away at your opponent's resources until they have nothing left while you drown in card advantage. But in Nature Runic specifically, Stinkbug was a uniquely powerful way of ending the battle phase because of the threat the Nature cards represented. You see, modern Nature is centered around the use of Nature Camellia and Nature Mole Cricket. These cards do so much for the strategy, with Mole Cricket essentially being an emergency teleport for any Nature in the deck that can summon two monsters if your opponent happens to control the high stack monster on the field, and can even bring itself back from the graveyard if your opponent summons a monster from the extra deck, or even if you summon a Naturia monster from yours. Meanwhile, Camilla is a level 4 tuner that's a foolish barrier on summon, allows you to send Nature a Sacred Tree for a search, or even the aforementioned Mole Cricket to revive later. This formed a really tight and compact engine, and with the straight of Camellia and Mole Cricket combined, they enabled Naturia Sunflower, a pretty busted monster negate that you could use twice against your opponent, 
thanks to Camellia's cost replacement making it so all you had to do was mill two cards instead. There was just one small issue with Sunflower though. It was tiny. So as long as your opponent could establish a single monster on board, they could easily beat over your two monster negates with one attack. And that's exactly where Stinkbug came in. Because Mulkrick can summon any two nature monsters with this quick effect. And there are a lot of solid options. But if you really want to protect your nature of Sunflower, you could just summon a stink bug alongside it. This puts your opponent in a terrible position. Because now they no longer have the luxury of just beating over your Omni Negate. Since the moment they declare an attack, stink bug will take the hit and Sunflower is protected, and they don't go to the battle phase. They have to play in the Sunflower regardless, so it's a lose-lose situation. And all without considering the Runic Engine backing up your deck. Because if your opponent can't end the game on their turn, they're going to be quite behind on card advantage. And that's honestly cool to have seen. That even in the modern era, battle tricks aren't as useless as people think. And when paired with the right deck with something to protect, they can still be just as important in deciding the winner of a duel as they ever were a decade ago. When paired with the right strategy at least. But regardless, it's still peculiar to see, it's hard to imagine losing to negate attack in 2023, but in Yu-Gi-Oh! anything is possible. And at number 7, we have number 30, Acid Golem of Destruction. A card that used to only see utility as a beat stick, but has now somehow managed to evolve into a turn 1 threat. And it doesn't really indicate why at first, it's not really basic. You can make Acid Golem with any two level 3s, but it's almost more of a detriment than it is a benefit. Because while you control it, you can't special summon monsters. And during each of your standby phases, you're either forced to detach a material or take 2,000 points of damage. But despite how damaging these detriments are, Acid Golem actually has a pretty storied history in Yu-Gi-Oh's metagame, specifically because it's the rank 3 monster with the highest attack, and it has been for quite a while, standing at a respectable 3,000 attack, which gives decks like Burning Abyss a way to deal with monsters that were a bit too strong for the Hide and Seek champion to contest. So while Acid Golem seeing meta success isn't the wildest thing to hear, what makes this card so peculiar in the modern era is that people are making it on their very first turn, which seems completely useless. Worse than useless even, because you're locking yourself out of doing anything else. But the fascinating thing about Yu-Gi-Oh! is the downsides of cards are only downsides because we haven't figured out a way to use them to our advantage yet. And in 2023, the stars aligned to allow for Acid Golem to return to the meta once again thanks to a genius use in Mikanko strategies. Mikanko is a deck that's mainly known for its solid trap interruptions and OTK potential, but it flexes the extra deck quite well, since they have some great extenders allowing them to flood the field with material, but was even more versatile with their extra deck when they had access to Isolde, a now banned Link monster that could summon any warrior from the deck by using equip spells, and Mikanko's just so happened to have a level 3 warrior and a ton of equips. And Isolde might just be the reason why Acid Golem was so playable, because it gave Mikanko decks near constant access to either Gen the Diamond Tiger or Ken the Warrior Dragon, two level 3 warrior monsters that will summon their other counterpart to your opponent's side of the field, who will then have a mandatory effect triggered by your opponent to benefit you in some way. These effects were generally quite strong, almost verging on toxic, since they also made your triple tactics talents and thrust active. But strangely, the part of these effects that enabled Acid Golem to be strong was the fact that they gave an opponent a monster that you got to choose the zone of. So, if you don't have access to Gen or Ken through drawing it, you would go through Isolde, summon one to your side of the field, and another to your opponent's zone in any one where a Genator Transverser could point to, a card that changes control of the two monsters that the Slink Arrows are pointing at. Then, after actually summoning Transverser with Isolde and another body, you could summon out your level 3 Bikonkos, or even use the Gen or Ken you summon to your side of the field to summon Acid Golem to the Geonator zone. You'll be locked out of special summoning when you do this, but only so long as Acid Golem is on your side of the field. And if you use Geonator to switch control of Acid Golem with the warrior on your opponent's side of the field, freeing you of Acid Golem's special summon lock by giving it to your opponent, essentially preventing them from playing the game. And that's really inventive. Really inventive. It's actually really interesting to see just how Acid Golem's utility has evolved having reinvented itself from merely a blue eyes white dragon to a card that can lock your opponent out of the game thanks to its weirdly beneficial downside. Scratching the surface at number 6 is Cyber Dark Claw, an amazing card that manages to see some real competitive success, but not in the deck you'd expect. Claw has three effects, the first being that if it's sent to the graveyard while equipped to a monster, you can target a Cyber Dark monster in your graveyard and add it to your hand. The third is that if the monster code that battles, you can send a monster from your extra deck to the grave. But most importantly, its second effect, which lets you discard it to add any Cyberdark spell or trap from your deck to your hand. 
And for Cyberdark decks, this effect is incredibly strong because not only does it put a level 3 or lower dragon in your grave for your Cyberdarks to equip, but getting to search any Cyberdark spell or trap gives you a lot of options. From Cyberdark Invasion being a solid interruption to even the original Cyberdark Impact. But the best card to search by far is Cyberdark Realm. Realm lets you add any Cyberdark monster from your deck to your hand, and even has an effect that lets you normal summon a Cyberdark from your hand for free, allowing it to use your regular normal summon on something else. Anything else, because neither Realm or Claw have any kind of restriction or lock on them, meaning they can theoretically be played in any deck that likes either level 3 or level 4 bodies. And it just so happens that Exa Sister was an incredibly powerful deck that really valued level 4 bodies. The reason why level 4 bodies are so valuable in Exa Sisters is because they can be used to go into the generic Exa Sister rank 4 monsters, which can search out archetypal engine pieces or disruption before overlaying into Exa Sister Magnifica, their main boss monster. But they can't rely on traditional level 4 extenders because of the archetype lock on Exa Sister Martha which prevents you from special summoning any monster that isn't an Exa Sister for the entire turn if you want to use your effect to summon yourself an Elis, forcing your deck to only rely on extenders that normal summon themselves to the field to play around your own lock. Thankfully, there's a lot of choices. The Spirit Engine of Sakitama and Aratama can get you a free rank 4 with just a single normal summon. The Dynamorphia Package gives you a level 4 and plays around your lock with only a special summon on your opponent's turn with a pretty impressive Floodgate to boot. And of course, the Cyber Dark Engine gives you a free normal summon body that you can do anything with. But there's one small detail that makes this particular engine even more interesting. Because every Exa Sister has an effect to actually summon an Exa Sister from your extra deck with just themselves the material, if a card is moved out of the graveyard. Usually, your opponent has to be the one to move the card for their effects to trigger. But Exa Sister Martha specifically can use her rank up effect when any player moves a card out of the graveyard. And when you normal summon Cyberdark Edge, Horn, or Keel, and equip Cyberdark Claw, this counts as moving a card out of your graveyard, giving you a free rank 4 on top of Martha. And that's amazing, because while Exorcist or Dynamorphia Spirit Cyberdark sounds like a deck made of a bunch of random cards, the small synergies these level 4 packages have managed to combine into making a really interesting deck. One that sounds insane on the surface, but is astonishingly well thought out. And swinging into number 5 is Axe of Fools, an equip spell that at first seems like just a worse version of Axe of Despair, because Axe of Fools and Despair do pretty much the same thing, give a monster 1000 attack, except Axe of Fools also negates the monster's effects it's equipped to. And during each standby phase, the control of the monster Fools equipped to also takes 500 damage. Thankfully, however, because Axe of Fools can also be equipped to an opponent's monster, this negation is actually quite beneficial, because you can use it in a way to negate the effects of your opponent's monsters to break their board, which is pretty nice utility, even if the card is utterly outclassed by Forbidden Chalice. But strangely enough, there was one strategy this year that was able to take advantage of Axe of Fools, not just as a board breaker, but as an interruption tool, Mikanko. Acid Golem Locks and OTKs aren't the only thing this deck is capable of. In fact, even on its own, it actually has some pretty powerful interruptions, especially with Hu Li allowing you to search out any of your deck's powerful trap cards. But it was Mikanko Rivalry that made Acts of Fools into a genuine meta threat. Because with Rivalry, as long as you control any Mikanko monster, you can target a monster on either player's field and equip it with an equip spell from your deck. Normally, Mikanko decks use this to equip Mikanko Reflection Rondo onto an opponent's monster to take control of it, depriving your opponent of a body that you can use on your own turn. But Rivalry isn't limited to just equipping Mikanko spells, it can get any equip spell. This opens the door to a ton of different possibilities for cards to equip both to your monsters and your opponents. But one of the best alternative options to Rondo is Axe of Fools, because it pretty much turns rivalry into an infinite impermanence. You see, the moment your opponent activates an on-field monster effect, you can use rivalry and equip Axe of Fools from the deck. Then, because Axe of Fools negation is continuous, it'll start applying the moment rivalry resolves, negating your opponent's monster's effect. And the best part is that there's no downside to fools in this scenario because of the way the Mikanko monsters work. So as long as they have cards equipped to them, they cannot be destroyed by battle, and your opponent takes any battle damage you would have taken. So increasing the attack of an opponent's monster is actually a benefit for you, because it means on the following turn, you have an easier route to OTK by crashing your Mikankos, and then 500 burn from the fools gets you even closer. Overall, Axe of Fools' utility is relatively simple, but there's no denying that as foolish as this axe makes it out to be, you have to be pretty smart to find the right synergies to use it competitively. And at number 4, we have Nimble Sunfish, the most surprising feature of the Nimble package played in Sprite. 
And the reason why it's so surprising is that Nimble Sunfish is pretty similar to old recruiters like Mystic Tomato and Shining Angel in that it needs to be destroyed by battle in order to activate its effects. And to its credit, Nimble Sunfish's effect is strong, not only summoning another copy of itself from the deck, but also letting you send a fish-type monster from your deck to the graveyard. In the modern era, if a card's only effect triggers whenever it's destroyed by battle, it's very likely that monster will never see any real competitive success, because waiting for your opponent to attack into your monster is unreliable, and giving up your own battle phase in an attempt to get destroyed is often giving up too much, where you'd much rather just play cards that start your plays naturally. Even Sprite, the deck that was known for being able to take advantage of the Nimble package, initially never really considered the utility of Sunfish as both Beaver and Angler generated a ton of bodies already without the need for the battle phase. Especially with the release of Sprite Sprint, an easy way to send Angler to the graveyard that solidified the Nimble package as the premier choice of level 2s for the Sprite-focused strategies and so Sunfish was almost fated to fall into obscurity. But just a month after Sprint's release, Sprite received another tool to add to its extending arsenal. Number two, Ninja Shadow Mosquito. Shadow Mosquito was an insane extra deck tool for Sprite, as it gave the deck a really unique way of OTKing by turning the attack of your opponent's monsters against them, by placing hallucination counters on your opponent's monsters on the first attack that you declare, and then burning your opponent for the attack of that hallucinating monster on every subsequent attack declaration. This covered up one of Sprite's main weaknesses, in that the monsters had relatively small attacks, which often made it difficult to OTK if an opponent had a monster on board, and this gave Nimble Sunfish a chance to shine. Because if you can get both Mosquito and Sunfish on board, you had an absurdly easy OTK path. By attack with Mosquito first, you put your hallucination counter onto your opponent's monster, then by crashing Sunfish, you burn your opponent for the attack of that monster. After that, you can use Sunfish's effect to summon another copy of itself and send a fish to your grave. And as it turns out, Nimble Angler is a fish, allowing you to summon two beavers from your deck in attack position by sending it to the graveyard. This means you have a further three attacks to burn your opponent with. And if they're still not dead, you can crash the other Nimble Sunfish you summoned, because it just so happens that none of the Nimble monsters have a hard once per turn. So you get to send another Angler to the graveyard, summon out the final Nimble Beaver, and then the third Nimble Angler from your deck, letting you burn two more times for a total of six burns with Mosquito's effect. This means that with Sunfish and Mosquito on field, if your opponent has dared to leave a monster with 1400 more attack in attack position, they've already lost and just didn't know it yet. In general, it's easy to write off similar recruiters in the modern day for being a relic of an ancient era, and in a lot of cases, you'd be right. But Sunfish's wild synergy with Mosquito and incidental strength of the Nimble Package and Sprite allowed for it to shine as one of the coolest but weirdest OTK enablers for the year. And a little late for Halloween at number 3, we have Ghost Trick Succubus who managed to pull off an impressive cosplay of X Purely Noir this year. Sokyu Boss is a rank 2 monster with a couple of pretty decent effects. Your opponent can't target it for attacks while you control another Ghost Trick monster, and it even has a decent removal effect, allowing you to detach a material to destroy a monster in the field with an attack less than or equal to the combined attack of all Ghost Trick monsters you control. And if you manage to destroy something, you even get to block out an opponent's monster zone. However, these effects are middling and didn't really stand up to the power level of other rank 2 monsters so it's pretty hard to see why it saw play at first. But the key component of Soki Boss is that it's a Ghost Trick Xyz monster, and every Ghost Trick Xyz monster can theoretically be used to rank up into Ghost Trick Angel of Mischief, who lets you add any Ghost Trick Spell or Trap from your deck to your hand. This enables a pretty solid and compact engine, because if you can make any rank 1, 2, or 3 Ghost Trick, you can overlay into Mischief and detach the Xyz you use to summon it to search out Ghost Trick Shot. Then you can use Shot to revive your Xyz, overlay into another Mischief on top, and then overlay both of those angels into Utopic Future, which you can then overlay into Utopic Draco Future, a monster negate that's also a snatch deal. Now, this has been a pretty well-known entity ever since MBT Yu-Gi-Oh's war on the Ghost Trick community, and it isn't too surprising to see since UDF is a great feature as part of an end board. But what's weird about Soki Boss specifically is that it was played in a deck that couldn't really make rank 2 monsters outside of its own archetype. So, when Purely played the Ghost Trick engine, it used Ghost Trick Dulhan as the material for Angel of Mischief, since Purely and Pure Lili are both level 1. But despite that, Soki Boss still featured as part of the Purely extra decks, and there's a specific blink and you'll miss it reason as to why, ex Purely Noir, who doesn't need a Purely monster in order to fulfill its alternative summon condition, it just needs any rank 2 monster with 5 or more Xyz materials. So, Purely would play an expanded Ghost Trick package, not only playing Ghost Trick Shot, but also Ghost Trick Renovation, a trap card that has a graveyard effect to let you XC summon any Ghost Trick monster on top of a Ghost Trick you already control, 
and Purely is a deck more than capable of getting cards in their hand to the graveyard. So Purely would go through their entire Ghost Trick line to make UDF with one notable change. The second Angel they summon would search Renovation so they could later discard it for memory. Then with UDF on the field and Renovation in the grave, you'd use two Purely monsters to overlay into another Dulahan, and then into your third Angel of Mischief who you could then attach another material to with with the graveyard effect of Ghost Trick Shot. And last but not least, you could use the graveyard effect renovation to overlay your mischief into Sokyu Boss. This will give you exactly 5 materials in your Sokyu Boss, allowing you to XC summon X Purely Noir with at least one Purely Monster attached as a material. Which means it's not only a towers, its spin is a quick effect. And this line enables Purely to make 2 X Purely Noirs, which actually has some pretty neat applications. With just one Noir, Purely is pretty weak to targeted Silver Bullets, like Herald of the Abyss, Xyz Encore, and Kurikara Divi Carnet, which is especially a problem if you want to use Noir's effect to draw during the standby phase. Likewise, with just a single Noir, sometimes you have to choose between being defensive and keeping your tower's protection, or being proactive by detaching materials and spinning cards at the bottom of the deck, which can sometimes put you in an awkward spot. But with two Noirs in the field, these issues simply don't exist. The silver bullets that were once busted against you now only deal with a single Noir, leaving the other standing. Even Kirikari is ineffective because, while you might want to use the effect of one of your Noirs to draw or spin, the Ghost Trick Noir just needs to stand there menacingly without using its effect unless its friend is outed. Sometimes it's hard to intuit why a card might be good at first, and this is especially the case for Ghost Trick Succubus. Nothing about the effect on the card itself actually tells you what it's capable of. It's all about the card surrounding it. But for Ghost Trick Purely, it was the linchpin that held the synergy between Purely and the wider Ghost Trick package together, allowing the archetype to combine in an incredibly unique way. And pulling the strings at number 2 is Marionette Might, a very specific mind control card. You see, Marionette Might's effect is simple but effective. You can discard it to target any fiend or zombie opponent controls and take control of it until the end phase. And there are a couple of other cards with similar utility for different types too, like Puppet Plant and Electric Virus both of which have seen decent competitive play in the past because taking control of the opponent's monster is just that good. But a card like Might seen play in the past year is odd. Taking control of an opponent's monster is an amazing effect to have, but theoretically, it should be redundant with plenty of other, better mind control cards available that can take control of any monster and not just a specific type. But Marionette Might has one strength that these cards don't have. It doesn't put a card on the field. Spell cards like Change of Heart are technically more effective on the surface. But because they commit a card to the field, if you try to steal Unchained Soul of Rage, your opponent then had the opportunity to chain Escape from the Chain to pop their own dog and Change of Heart still the field, preventing the card from being stolen. And because one of their monsters has been destroyed, they can trigger the graveyard effect of Unchained Soul Lord of Yama to revive Rage whose interruption is still alive. But Marionette Might discards itself from the hand and never puts itself on the field, meaning there would be no valid target for Escape, preventing it from being able to activate and dodging the mind control effect. And if they don't have a Shavar in hand ready, you effectively cut Unchained off from 4 points of interaction. Rage was now on your side of the field and wasn't destroyed, preventing your opponent from Blink Summoning or adding back Shavar from the graveyard. Escape then can't be used since your opponent won't have an Unchained on the side of the field, and Yama now has no opportunity to trigger in the grave. Now eventually Unchained strategies adapted to mind control cards like Marionette Might, specifically by putting Rage in the grave on their turn with Shavar in hand. Allow them to revive Rage at the perfect moment with the effect of Yama triggering from Shivara's quick effect. But it says something that the minutiae of how a card is activated can completely alter how it's used, and makes the world of difference between a card like Change of Heart and Might. And that's awesome. It's reminiscent of the philosophy that we see in the anime and is intrinsic to Yu-Gi-Oh itself, that no card is truly redundant, even if there are cards with wider utility or just stronger versions than others. These small differences allow them to exist as equals in their right context. And disturbing the piece at number one is Disturbance Strategy, the weirdest card of the year. Disturbance is an old, obscure card with an effect that reads like it does nothing, allowing you to shuffle your opponent's hand into the deck to force them to draw the same number of cards, effectively resetting their hand. But with the right combination of cards, Disturbance Strategy has potential to be an FTK, but only with the right combination. On its own, Disturbance Strategy is a terrible card that does almost nothing, or at least not enough to justify its use. You can technically mess up an opponent's hand and using it after an important surge to get rid of that card from their hand or replace it with something new, potentially even breaking them. But there's an equal or higher chance that you end up giving them an even stronger hand than they had before. It's essentially a big gamble. However, Disturbance Strategy still shuffles your opponent's hand into the deck, 
So, if you can find a way to resolve it while your opponent can't draw cards, you will have gotten rid of their entire hand. And there are a couple of ways of doing this, but the reason why Disturbance strategies saw play this year is because of how Chimera strategies were able to take advantage of both the card and their support of Beast, Fiend, and Illusion monsters. You see, with the release of Age of Overlord, Chimera got Burfamit the Mythical King of the Phantom Beast, an alternative Chimera to King of the Phantom Beast that's just as easy to make, requiring any two monsters of different types so long as those types are Beast, Fiend, or Illusion. And on Fusion Summon, Burfamit can send any Beast, Fiend, or Illusion from your deck to the graveyard, and you have a lot of great potential targets for this. But if you want to take advantage of Disturbance Strategy, the card you'll be sending is Protector of the Sanctuary, which, while on the field, has a continuous effect to prevent your opponent from drawing cards in any phases that isn't the draw phase. After that, it's just a matter of getting Chimera the King of Phantom Beast to the graveyard, which is laughably easy to do in the deck designed around summoning it with Chimera Fusion. With this setup, you have everything you need. By activating Disturbance Strategy as Chainlink 1, you can then use Chimera's Graveyard Effect as Chainlink 2 to revive the Protector of the Sanctuary that you sent with Burfamid. Then, because cards in Yu-Gi-Oh try to resolve as much as possible, Disturbance Strategy will shuffle your opponent's hand into their deck, but with Protector of the Sanctuary on the field, they won't be able to draw their cards. Which means that if you sequence this combo correctly, your opponent is left with literally zero cards in hand and no way of fighting back. And that rules! That these modern versions of Chimera fulfill the promise of nostalgia, not only by calling back to the olden days of the game, but by making not one, but two old, weird cards playable together. Protector of the Sanctuary and Disturbance Strategy have it all. They're strange, fun-looking cards that you would think nothing of. But with a little bit of inventiveness and ingenuity, any card in Yu-Gi-Oh is playable. But some, like Disturbance Strategy, are definitely weirder than others. Alright, and that's the list. If you think we missed any other strange cards, or have ideas for other videos you'd like to see, please let us know down in the comments below.